stuff we want to talk about in Vitality. The last irreversible enzyme, the cytokines. Um, this one is uh, regulated so multiple ways, but one thing is allosterically viable with the fructose one six dysphosphate. So, um, all of that here at the earlier in energy investment phase of Vitality, uh, that will activate the cytokines. So basically, it's a way to coordinate both phases of glycolysis. More glycolysis, sort of the initial part of it is happening, will start to push the whole second part of it to go even faster. Um, so that will activate the way to kind of use those one signal to dysphosphate. Um, this helps us, so like I said, coordinate this. Also, uh, it's going to be regulated by ATP, so energy levels, so kind of similar, you don't want to want glycolysis if you have ATP and things. So ATP, that's a high level of this, will uh, in inhibit um, pyruvate kinase. Uh, high level of uh, acetyl-CoA, which are going to come from one of the things from the citric acid cycle are involved with that other other metabol. Basically, it's another high energy molecule. Um, that if that level is high, that will inhibit it. And also, if you have a lot of just heavy melanine amino acid, that would be another indicator that you have a lot of energy and there's no reason to do glycolysis. Um, so all these things are going to inhibit pyruvate kinase. Um, and then finally, uh, this is regulated by in the liver um, by phosphorylation that's induced by hormones. Uh, so phosphorylation is going to activate, uh, when, when glucose levels are lower, glucagon release, glucagon will activate a kinase that's going to phosphorylate um, pyruvate kinase and uh, uh, cause it to um, be inactivated. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit here um, in this diagram. So this summarizes uh, what happens with that phosphorylation. We'll start with this, and then we'll get into this is basically the one where I just talked about. So uh, different isoforms of every big kinase, there's one liver, there's one muscle, so one parts of the body. And in the liver version, the liver isozyme, we have pyruvate that is responsive to this phosphorylation here. So glucagon levels, if they're high, are going to activate a certain kinase called PKA, a very common signaling kinase. Um, that will be, be basically that will phospho phosphorylate um, pyruvate kinase, causing it to be inactive, shutting down glycolysis. Um, and uh, remember, this is just in the liver. <laughs> now, uh, a phosphatase can remove this uh, under conditions where there's not a lot of glucagon. So basically, if the blood glucose level goes back up, and then you want to turn back on um, and activate pyruvate kinase by getting rid of that phosphorylation. That's what that PKA is, phosphatase. Now, <clears throat> that's just for the pyruvate kinase, the L, the, the liver form, L for liver. Pyruvate kinase in the muscle and the liver. So this happens with the liver version and with the muscle version. Um, are responsive to everything I just talked about. ATP, acetyl-CoA, um, uh, uh, alanine, those things are going to activate or inactivate the muscle form and the liver form. The phosphorylation with responsiveness to glucagon, that's only in the liver. So that's sort of a little bit overlap, but um, it really gives it so that we have very fine control of glycolysis and, um, in the liver, and the differences that you have in the liver versus other parts of the body. Okay, so um, that's sort of the main last bit of stuff we wanted to go over for how we regulate glycolysis. Are there questions on how this is working? All the other so all the seven other enzymes are reversible, and so they're not really regulated. Um, uh, the directionality of it and how fast those reactions go, the flux through those path, those enzymes, is determined by how these irreversible enzymes are. So that's why we talk about future. Okay, um, the last topic in regulation is glycogen. Now, I mentioned that's one of the common things that happens in the liver is that a high blood glucose level, the blood glucose level will come, the blood glucose will come in, and um, typically a lot of it will be stored in glycogen form um, for later. Basically. Uh, and so there's this process of making and breaking down the glycogen. Um, the storage and then the breaking it back down for glucose and then get energy from it uh, uh, after you get back to glucose. But the process of forming and breaking, uh, breaking down and forming glycogen <coughs> is what we're going to mention in this last bit of regulation.
So remember, glycogen um, from earlier is all glucose. Um, it's a storage form of glucose. We have uh, glucose linked alpha 1, 4 in the linear parts of, of, of glycogen, and then alpha 1, um, uh, 1, 6 linked um, uh, 1, 6 linked for the, uh, the little, little linkers um, every once in a while. Now, so it forms a branched glucose kind of tree of, of, of glucose here in the glycogen um, uh, storage parts. Now, there's two processes of uh, glycogenolysis. And I'll use birthday kind of sounds some of it. Glycogenolysis, meaning you're breaking down glycogen, and the end product would be eventually getting into basically glucose, so you can use that. Um, things like uh, transport out of the liver. Um, let's say when you get when you break down glycogen, you get it into glucose 6-phosphate um, and the glucose, and then usually that's exported out of the liver to increase the blood glucose level of blood. Uh, uh, also, um, uh, muscles, they would break down uh, glycogen and probably use that glucose to glycolysis for energy. Glycogenesis. Glycogenesis, um, so the genesis of glycogen, that's going to synthesize glycogen. A lot of that is mainly happening in the liver. Some of it happens in the muscle, but like under most conditions, you're going to have a lot of glycogenesis happening in the liver. Okay, so we're going to talk about these processes, and there's two important enzymes, one for glycogenolysis and one for glycogenesis. It's pretty much like the first enzyme and a couple enzymes. They're very small. It's not like a pathway. There's a couple enzymes that need to be done that we have to talk about for how these two processes work. And the first enzyme in each of these is going to be regulated, whether or not you do the whole process of glycogenesis um, uh, or glycogenolysis is going to be regulated by the, the, the um, status of these two important enzymes. So that's what we're going to round up with and how, how these enzymes are regulated by hormones. Okay, but first we have to talk about how this is working um, overall to make, uh, we'll start with glycogenolysis, how we break down Glycogen. Now, that's a series of enzymes. So the first one is glycogen phosphorylase. This is the one that is going to start by um, uh, uh, on the non-reducing parts of the glycogen end. So basically, there's a lot of non-reducing ends on glycogen, and so glycogen phosphorylases would be multiple of those that hook out kind of on the branches of the tree of glycogen, kind of uh, come in there, and they will start to break off uh, uh, pieces of the, um, the linear parts of the glycogen. So they'll be able to break that apart. Um, and it gets close to these branch points. So uh, basically, glycogen phosphorylase is great for getting rid of the alpha-1-4 linkages. But when it gets near the branch points, it needs two other enzymes. That is the debranching enzyme, well, like one other enzyme, basically the debranching enzyme. So that's going to be there to help get rid of the branch points, these alpha-1-6 linkages of the glucose. And then you go back, and glycogen phosphorylase cuts off the rest of it. Well, one, one, uh, like one group of that enzyme. So uh, it looks like this. Um, this is remember this is the regulation point. Um, uh, glycogen phosphorylase is activity. If you turn that off, you don't have any breakdown of glycogen. Um, so just keep that in mind as we explain this process. So we have the non-reducing end. Remember, reducing ends are uh, at that first carbon, and if those are linked through a, uh, if they're linked to anything. Um, especially out of the sugars, that's not going to be, um, that, that, that's not, not a reducing sugar, but the whole idea here is that the non reducing end, the one that's not, not able to um, convert from the linear to circular form, uh, is over here at the uh, fourth position. Okay, so um, what we have here is that uh, we have the alpha 1 4 linkages of glycogen. Glycogen phosphorylase is going to uh, take inorganic phosphate. And add it across this uh, across this uh, across this bond between the sugar and the glucose sugar. So you get phosphate attached at the first position. You get glucose one phosphate. That's the piece. That's the form that glucose gets kicked off the glycogen. Glucose one phosphate. The phosphate piece is inorganic phosphate. It's one of the substrates in the bag. And then we're left with a new non-reducing end. And then that can happen. It's short, and the glycogen is shortened by one. Glucose. So we have uh, this first step here: glucose one phosphate, and we have short glycogen. And this is all done by glycogen phosphorylase. Glycogen phosphorylase. Very important enzyme. 
Um, this is just kind of a diagram showing how this is working, where um, the non-reducing ends, you, you'll have a um, legacy class four lace cutting through all the alpha one four linkages. So you have a bunch of uh, those one phosphate molecules. You get close to one of these branch points. You need to transfer, um, you need that uh, branching enzyme. It takes, uh, transfers uh, some of these extra, um, some, of these, some of these glucose that are near that branch point puts them down and sort of the, the back in the linear alpha one four linkages. And then there is the um, uh, uh, debranching enzyme acts again to get rid of that single glucose here uh, from the um, alpha one six. Uh, so then and then back here to glycogen phosphorylate with the linear alpha one four part. So it's a little bit of shuffling back and forth. Debranching enzyme for the near those branch points, and then the glycogen phosphorylate for the, the linear alpha one four part of glycogen. <coughs> now, um, glucose one phosphate is actually obviously not a form that we've really talked about before. Um, we've talked more about uh, glucose six phosphate or just plain glucose. And so there's an enzyme that, you, that, that the next step here is that an enzyme needs to change the position of that phosphate to get us to glucose six phosphate. That's a much more usable form of glucose. Um, and this is done by phosphoglucomutase. Phosphoglucomutase, well, um, kind of similar to that, that, that mutase in glycolysis, that there's an active site serine that's pre-phosphorylated, and um, that a glucose one phosphate binds to the active site, phosphate gets transferred to the first position. You have an intermediate of glucose one six is phosphate, and then you lose the phosphate at the uh, uh, at, 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 at the um, uh, at the first position. Uh, and so it sort of looks like once again that it's sort of um, it kind of looks like it's sort of swapping it, but it, the phosphates are coming from different different things here. So same thing as the basic glycolysis. Um, so here's the serine set of histines. There's only one two. Uh, so now glucose six phosphate. This can, in the liver, typically this will be dephosphorylated and transported out through the blood transporters in the blood. Um, or, <coughs> either in the liver or definitely in the muscles, that glucose 6 phosphate could typically go through glycolysis. I guess theoretically it could also go through the pentose phosphate path, too, but it's, it's that common molecule now that we talked about a lot, the glucose 6 phosphate. Okay, this is carried out by phosphoglucomutase, um, uh, and, and, and once again, it, each time um, glycogen phosphorylate gets a glucose one phosphate, that glucose one phosphate that's produced by that is going to be converted into glucose six phosphate. So really, the end of glycogenolysis for the most part is going to be glucose six phosphate. That's sort of the end molecule for uh, what glycogen gets broken down into. Okay, so. Um, and then this is just showing what happens if the liver wanted to get rid of that glucose 6-phosphate. Because remember, glucose 6-phosphate um, can't be transferred out of the collect transporter. You have to get rid of that phosphate. It has to be just glucose. It can't be glucose 6-phosphate. Um, and so uh, glucose 6-phosphatase, which is the last step of uh, uh, gluconeogenesis, that enzyme can function here, too in the liver to dephosphorylate glucose 6-phosphate that was broken down from the glycogen um, so we can export the glucose out of the blood transporter into the blood, increasing the blood glucose level. So this is how the liver can increase blood glucose level by breaking down glycogen stores um, to uh, now get the glucose out of the cell. <clears throat> and then that, that blood glucose will probably go to the muscles or something on the brain to be uh, broken down via glycolysis for energy in those other parts of the body. Okay. They may wonder what, how the liver actually gets energy. They actually, the primary way that the liver gets its own energy, for the most part, is breaking down fat. So we don't talk about this in the that class, but just to mention that the liver does get energy, but it gets it actually through usually breaking down those fatty acids um, and not necessarily the majority of it by, break, by glycolysis. Those are other things like the muscle and the brain that do primary glycolysis. Okay, qu questions on this? Okay. Um, now, glycogenesis. So this is making glucose, so taking glucose and converting it into glycogen. 
Um, there's a few steps here. Uh, uh, one involves hexokinase from glycolysis to get us to glucose 6-phosphate. That's the start of that. Um, and so glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. We have um, uh, the reverse of the phosphoglucose mutase reaction that we just talked about, so that's reversible. Um, we can take glucose 6-phosphate and put it and make glucose 1-phosphate. So that's just the reverse of the reaction I just mentioned for, for uh, glycogen, glycogen you know, light. Then we get to glucose 1-phosphate, and then this is a little bit unique for this uh, for this pathway. Um, we have glucose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase. Now, this needs to take uh, basically uh, take uh, UTP, so literally uridine triphosphate, so we talked about in RNA, UTP, and specifically add it to glucose. So we make UDP glucose. So two of the phosphates go away here. We have UDP glucose that gets formed from this. That's just a way, basically, to activate the glucose so that you can <coughs> take another glucose molecule and attach it to UDP glucose, and then you get rid of the UDP. So the UDP is just a way to activate the glucose uh, so that we can make uh, link it together and form the alpha-1-6 linkages that we get in glycogen. So it's sort of a way to activate this. Uh, now, glycogen, glycogen synthase is the main regulation point. I think I said earlier that the first enzyme is the regulation point. Um, in this case, that for, for glycogenesis, since that first enzyme is in glycolysis, um, the first sort of um, specific enzyme for this that's important for regulating glycogenesis that we're going to talk about is glycogen synthase. So that would be the stuff that's heavily regulated by hormones to decide whether or not you actually make the glycogen or not. Okay. And just to show you, I mean, UDP glucose is <coughs> glucose um, linked to uh, UDP uridine diphosphate, so there's two phosphates on here. Um, and when you transfer, when you add, basically when you um, add the UDP here, you are, um, you actually already have a phosphate on here, so you're, you're, you're not like, you just have two phosphates here at the end linked through the first position to 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 the uh, to, to, to your, that's what it is. Okay. Okay, so um, mainly the liver, once again, here for making glycogen. So um, synthes synthesizing the branches, uh, there's a glycogen branching enzyme that I'm just kind of roughly mentioned that, that basically um, you, you make a, the alpha-1 formula for a while um, until you get to a certain number, about 11 or so glucose molecules, and then the glycogen branching enzyme is going to take um, uh, seven of those here in, the, uh, in white and transfer them alpha-1-6 over to the sort of the first glucose. And that'll make an alpha-1-6 linkage with seven glucose molecules um, that are on here. And then now you have two new non-reducing ends, and those will, will be built out um, another uh, total of about 11 or so again, and then it will make another branch, another branch, another branch, to make this more and more branch. So that's roughly how this is working. Okay. So um, overall, that's the general process of making glycogen. Um, and just to sort of clarify, I'm not going to have you draw the structures for these two processes at all, um, but I definitely do want you to know the names of everything that's involved with this. So names, number one. Um, also, you should still remember how what the, like, the linkages for glycogen are, alpha-1-4 and alpha-1-6. Um, you should definitely remember that part, but I'm not going to have you draw all these structures on this next, on this last thing, but... Okay, um, questions on these reactions specifically? Before I get into regulation? No. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, in the last part now, control of glycogen metabolism. So we just wanted to introduce these, these, these comparatively simple pathways compared to like glycopenol. You know, it's not nearly as intense as glycolysis and glycogenesis, um, but pretty important, very important. Um, and, and so these are all regulated by hormones. We're going to try to tie this back down to the activity of those two important enzymes. So when insulin is released, um, we're going to have a couple things that happen here. Uh, we're going to increase glucose transport into the muscles, 
Um, so it makes, you know, basically high blood glucose level that will sort of cause the blood transporter transport to go inside the cell. So um, all cells are going to have an increased transport of glucose. You're going to activate glycolysis by stimulating exokinase um, when you have insulin present. That's also going to happen. Um, if you want to basically work through that, work through the high levels of glucose, you're going to activate glycogen synthase. So insulin release activates glycogen synthase. This is going to uh, cause excess glucose to be stored as glycogen in primarily the liver. So that's going to activate, so that's something that's going to happen. These, these are more, uh, the, the glycolysis things are mainly more on the muscles. In the liver, we're going to activate glycogen synthase. So it's going to uh, uh, activate glycogenolite, uh, glycogenesis, glycogenesis, making glycogen. This is all happening when glucose level is high. And then eventually here, your insulin levels will start to go uh, effectively then. What that means is when you release insulin, that's a way to uh, get your body to reduce your blood glucose levels. You don't want blood glucose levels too high, too long. That can cause uh, all sorts of bad things to happen. Um, people that have diabetes, that's a very common thing that happens, is that your blood glucose levels are way too high for various reasons. Um, potentially you can't excrete insulin, you can't make insulin, you can't respond to insulin. Um, there's lots of reasons why, uh, but your blood glucose levels are typically not um, And so this hormone, uh, a little bit about these hormones. So um, the, uh, there's, there's these counter regulators we talked about for this blood glucose level concentration thing. So high blood glucose level, lots of insulin. And um, things that sort of start to counter this are when the, uh, are, are other things called uh, the, the glucagon we talked about already, and then epinephrine, AKA adrenaline. Um, so this is sort of the next little thing I want to talk about. But glucagon, that's going to trigger basically the opposite things, and, and so is epinephrine for the most part. These are going to trigger the opposite things that insulin did. Um, it's going to be things that say, okay, we don't have a lot of glucose in the blood, release epinephrine, release, um, release glucagon. Uh, and so the glucagon is going to promote um, glu uh, gluconeogenesis in the liver. Um, uh, then the um, also, it's going to trigger glycogen breakdown in the liver um, to release the glucose here, promote glucogenolysis. So what that means is that the liver, when, when glucagon is released, the liver is going to take, uh, produce as much glucose as it can. It's going to produce it by breaking down glycogen to get to glucose, and it's going to be a, be a glycogen, a glycogenolysis, and it's going to do gluconeogenesis to get more glucose. Because the liver's job, when the blood glucose level is low, is to excrete glucose into the blood to try to raise the blood glucose level back up. Yeah. Is this done synonymously? Is it what? Is this done synonymously at the same time? Um, oh, with epinephrine and glucagon? Um, or, at, at, or insulin and glucagon? The glyco, you know. Like oh, yes, the yes. That's happening at the same time. So, uh, Gluconeogenesis is going to take non-carbohydrate molecules in the mitochondria, get them out of the cytoplasm, and produce glucose. And then that glucose is going to be exported. And then other glucose in the liver you're going to get is by breaking down glycogen. So that's happening all at the same time when glucagon is, is released. And that's a way for the liver to get your blood glucose levels back up, or at least maintain them at a certain concentration. Yeah, there's lots of stuff. So yeah, when we talk about these pathways, you know, we focus on one, we talk about it, but a lot of times these things are happening at the same time. Yeah. Okay, now epinephrine, or adrenaline here, this is going to be um, something that's a little bit more, um, it has similar qualities to glucagon, uh, but it's not necessarily always released when blood glucose level is low. Uh, it's something kind of more related to the fight or flight response. This is something that um, your body is just trying to survive, and so for a short-term burst of energy, it's going to kind of burn everything down and, and to maximize as much energy as possible. So it's going to start by inhibiting insulin secretion. Um, it's going to stimulate uh, uh, glycogenolysis in the muscles. Um, that, uh, that typically doesn't always happen too much under most normal conditions, 
those are usually pretty good stores of glycogen. Um, so that just means that the muscles are going to get as much glucose as possible by breaking down the glycogen, and then they're going to do glycolysis to get energy from that glucose to get from that glycogen. Also, um, you're going to have uh, glycolysis then from that glucose you get from the glycogenolysis in the muscles, and you're going to have gluconeogenesis in the liver. Uh, so, you know, it basically, for the most part, the same thing as we've got. Um, other things get triggered by this too. For the most part, this is this is short bursts of a lot of amount of energy here, um, and it's like holding nothing back. Uh, all metabolism is focused on maintaining and increasing blood glucose levels and maximizing energy. Um, nothing's going to be stored in like that. There's no storage uh, uh, in, in, in when adrenaline, adrenaline is released. Maximum amount of energy. Okay, so um, uh, now I sort of want to talk a little bit about how these hormones can regulate glyco, um, uh, glycogenolysis first and then glycogenesis at the end, so these two enzymes. Um, so uh, glycogenolysis, um, this is going to be, talk, we're going to talk about how we can activate glycogen uh, or inhibit glycogen phosphorylase. Glycogen phosphorylase, that's the, basically, if that goes, the whole pathway goes. Um, you, you, if you inhibit glycogen phosphorylase, you don't break down glycogen. Uh, you activate it, then you do. Uh, so, um, glucagon and epinephrine, both of these are going to activate glycogen phosphorylase. You're going to break down glycogen when you activate this, when those are released. Uh, and so, um, remember what's happening here is that glycogen phosphorylase is going to generate glucose 1 phosphate by breaking it off of the uh, alpha-1-4 linkages present in glycogen. So this phosphorylase, uh, glycogen phosphorylase, um, we have uh, uh, A and, and, and uh, B forms uh, for the glycogen phosphorylase that are present um, at, uh, uh, sort of basically in different forms here that are related to the phosphorylation. Now, um, when they're phosphorylated, uh, when this is phosphorylated, the glycogen phosphorylase is going to be in the active form. And when it's dephosphorylated, it's going to be less active or not basically inhibited. Um, and, and so what happens is that in uh, different tissues, different signals kind of trigger these sort of. And so glucagon in the liver is going to activate a phosphorylase uh, kinase enzyme, a kinase enzyme that will phosphorylate glycogen phosphorylase and will cause it to be active. So glucagon in the liver activates a kinase and that kinase phosphorylates this glycogen phosphorylase and you activate glycogenolysis in the liver. In the muscles, we have epinephrine and um, other uh, uh, sort of low energy AMP and then calcine, which is related to um, muscle signaling things that we won't get into, <laughs> muscle contraction and stuff. Um, uh, uh, but basically the summary here is that epinephrine releasing here is going to have the same effect as glucagon, but in the muscles. And so in the muscles, that's going to phosphorylate um, the activated kinase that phosphorylates glycogen phosphorylase, and um, we activate glycogenolysis. Uh, then uh, when these signals go down, you have less glucagon, you have less epinephrine, there'll be a phosphatase enzyme. That phosphatase enzyme will get rid of these these two phosphorylation uh, positions on here, and you'll go back to the less active form, and you won't have a lot of glycogenolysis in both tissues, uh, both muscle and liver. So this is sort of generally what's happening with regulation here of the uh, glycogenolysis by this phosphorylation that's triggered in the liver by glucagon and the muscle by epinephrine. <clears throat> now, glycogenesis. So this, um, Remember, um, making glycogen, uh, and for this we have um, a lot of signals that are going to sort of once again trigger the phosphorylation or dephosphorylation, and that's what it can say whether or not you do uh, you still you make glycogen or not. Um, and so for this we have glycogen synthase. Glycogen synthase is the enzyme that we're going to talk about in regulation, um, and, and once again if it's inactive you don't do um, glycogen, <coughs> you don't make glycogen. So um, when glycogen synthase is phosphorylated, it's inactive, and when it's dephosphorylated, it's active. So dephosphorylated here, you make glycogen. And its phosphorylation is dependent on, as you can see, a lot of different signals. So insulin levels, that will inhibit a, um, 
insulin levels are being released, high insulin levels, that's going to inhibit a kinase, a GSK3 of the kinase. That, that, that kinase, that normally phosphorylates it to make it inactive. So that means that when insulin levels are high, you have active glycogen synthesis. Um, that means then that you would make glycogen with high levels of insulin. Um, and then uh, there is a phosphatase, this is PP1 down here, that's a phosphatase, that removes these phosphorylation sites here on the, on the glycogen synthase. Uh, that will be activated by insulin, so opposite effect. Insulin inhibits the kinase, keeps it in the active form. Insulin activates a phosphatase, so that if it's in the inactive form, it goes to the active form. Now, um, glucagon and epinephrine, these inhibit the phosphatase. So they make sure that the inactive form is not when glucagon and epinephrine are present. Um, and then there's other things with, if you have high levels of glucose or glucose 6-phosphate, that's going to activate this because um, those are basically some of the substrates for, uh, if you have a lot of that, you're probably going to want to store that in glycogen form. And so that further increases this pathway of glycogen. Okay. Um, so uh, with these specific, some of these things are like specific names of kinases and things. If you just know that there are kinases that are involved, that's all I'm really going for. Um, not specific names. These are all really broad kinases that are used in all sorts of biosignaling. Um, it doesn't necessarily matter for this class that you know the specific name of the specific kinase. <clears throat> okay. Um, so this is how we're regulating glycogenesis, making glycogen. Uh, questions on this process? So that's how we get these hormones to actually activate or inhibit this process. Um, so uh, just to kind of summarize here, we've talked a lot about how um, glycogen, uh, or sorry, uh, glycolysis and glucagon genesis can be regulated in opposite ways. Uh, and the main regulation points were the three irreversible steps of glycolysis. And then um, that last little bit about glycogen synthesis and lysis, um, and how that can connect down to uh, what happens in the liver and the muscles, that's regulated all by, well, a lot of it by hormones. <coughs> okay, so last topic of the class, um, and I'll sort of rapid fire at the end here. Uh, this is the citric acid cycle. So this cycle, uh, this is sort of now picking up with what happens, uh, what happened at the end of glycolysis. So we have pyruvate, we got some pyruvate, um, and, and, and now the citric acid cycle is going to take that pyruvate um, and move it into the mitochondria. So now we're moving into mitochondria, all this is in the mitochondria. Um, and in the mitochondria, we're going to process that pyruvate uh, and, and do a lot of oxidation, get a lot of reduced cofactors. Um, those reduced cofactors are going to be uh, uh, heavily used later to get more ATP indirectly um, uh, from, from further processing. Uh, and so you won't see a direct, like a lot of ATP made in this pathway. Um, it's more about getting a lot of reduced cofactors from this. From this. Uh, so um, we're going to, uh, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that this whole process is called cellular respiration, taking um, molecules, oxidizing them, um, and then putting them in the mitochondria, running through the citric acid cycle, um, and doing a lot of electron transfer here to get oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation um, is sort of what happens with all the reduced cofactors of getting the electrons, setting up a proton gradient in the mitochondria, membrane, all that stuff that you might have heard in biology that we're not going to get into too much more. But um, the idea here is that this is a very, very highly conserved process of cellular respiration that requires oxygen because the very last uh, uh, process here uh, requires that you have uh, oxygen as an electron acceptor, uh, and so you have to have oxygen for cellular respiration to occur. Um, now, that means then that up to this point with glycolysis, you could go to lactic acid under anaerobic conditions um, and, and still do glycolysis for a while. Cancers do that, um, cancer cells do that, uh, uh, activated muscles do that. Um, but to go any further, in this case with the, uh, with the citric acid cycle, you have to have oxygen present. Um, 
And so there's sort of three main stages. We have to make acetyl-CoA from pyruvate, and then we're going to oxidize it uh, quite a bit and um, through the acidic acid cycle. And then this last part of, of, this, of cellular respiration is that electron transfer and oxidative phosphorylation that I'm just gonna mention happens, and um, you'd have to take that out to hear more about that. So um, this is sort of summarized. We talked about glycolysis, glycolysis by glucose and pyruvate. Um, also, uh, uh, other things can result in making acetyl-CoA. So this is sort of our, our first point here in cellular respiration is that acetyl-CoA is a very common uh, molecule that's made by all these different processes of oxidation, of, of catabolism. So if you break down amino acids from proteins, you break down fatty acids, you break down glucose, all those things will get us to acetyl-CoA. So that, to this point, basically the same. <clears throat> And so from here on, there's a lot of this whole citric acid cycle is pretty central for all of catabolism. So that's why I'm in on that in this semester. And you can see all these electrons coming from here. That's because we're oxidizing these intermediates. And so those electrons are, are going to be stored temporarily in these cofactors. So like NADH, um, we'll see another one, but NADH is one of the common ones um, that we can get those electrons back later. Uh, the, next, the, the first thing that happens with pyruvate, though, is that in the mitochondria, there's pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. That's going to get rid of one of the carbons of pyruvate uh, and then add it to CoA, enzyme CoA, which is a cofactor. We mentioned briefly early in the semester, but it's a cofactor that uh, basically the acetyl group is added to. And this is a very, very high, uh, uh, common molecule, acetyl CoA, that, as I said, is very central for metabolism. So that's stage one. Stage two is that all these reduced cofactors, um, you know, come in from the from glycolysis and other pathways. And then in the citric acid cycle, we take that acetyl-CoA and we oxidize it um, a bunch more, quite a bit of oxidation steps. And we generate even more reduced cofactors, a lot of what's done here. A lot of NADH, FADH2, which is pretty much the same thing. We'll, we'll see it's a little bit different, but effectively it's another reduced cofactor, more electrons. Um, these, are going, these reduced cofactors are going to then um, uh, sort of be used later. And we actually only generate one GTP in the entire citric acid cycle. Um, so directly here, so we don't generate a lot of uh, direct energy, but we do in the citric acid cycle, but we generate a lot of reduced cofactors. And then so in the electron transfer oxidative phosphorylation, just like I said in a nutshell, um, those reduced cofactors are going to put their electrons um, into this electron transport chain and indirectly through oxidative phosphorylation using the, that sort of potential you get from having all the electrons in there in a certain spot in the mitochondria, you will generate ATP. Um, and the key is that you have to have oxygen for this last reaction so that you can do this transfer to make ATP. So this whole process very hinges on a lot here, the, 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 the presence of, of oxygen. <clears throat> so this is where we get a lot of the ATP produced from um, cellular respiration is from this last step here of the um, uh, electron transfer. <clears throat> okay, so that's sort of the third stage of cellular respiration. Um, now we're going to focus on the first part here of the uh, Generating acetyl CoA today, definitely today, and then um, uh, probably on Monday, finishing with talking about the oxidation of that in the citric acid site. Um, and that's sort of where we're going to finish the semester. So, just to clarify here, the citric acid cycle is in the mitochondria, as I just said a little bit ago. Um, and so, we're moving the pyruvate into the mitochondria. And then, in the mitochondria, we generate the ATP or the acetyl CoA. And then, the acetyl CoA enters the citric acid cycle, and we do, we generate a lot of those. Um, a lot of those reduced cofactors by oxidizing, pyruvate, and then into different forms throughout the whole cycle. Um, this is in the mitochondria matrix. So this is sort of the, the mitochondria have an outer membrane, the inner mitochondria membrane that's harder to get in and out of. That's why we had to talk about phthalate earlier. Um, and then the matrix, which is the very center. So it's sort of the, the center part of the mitochondria. So we're sort of the heart of the mitochondria here. Um, there is one step, one enzyme, step six of the citric acid cycle called succinate dehydrogenase. That is actually embedded in the inner mitochondria membrane. All the other enzymes of the citric acid cycle um, are kind of floating around on the inside of the matrix. So 
but one one little extra this. Um, uh, let's see here. Oxidative phosphorylation, that's going to occur um, in when kind of on and around the inner mitochondrial membrane too. So this inner mitochondrial membrane is very, very, very like vital pretty much for all for, for this um, generation of uh, ATP at the very end of all this. Um, okay, so first thing that happens, everybody transported into the mitochondrial matrix. That will start off all this next the last series of, of uh, steps here for the citric acid cycle. There's a transporter that does this called pyruvate translocase. That's embedded in the inner mitochondrion membrane that allows for pyruvate to get through. Like I said, that the inner mitochondrion membrane, you can't just get through that just normally. You have to have a certain transporter usually to get across that. Um, and so now pyruvate will be in the mitochondrion matrix and all the reactions that we talk about from now until basically from now until the semester are going to be within the mitochondrion. Okay, so what we have first is this really big complex of many, many different enzymes and lots of cofactors. Um, I know it seems like this wouldn't be this hard, uh, but what we're doing here is we're taking pyruvate and we're converting it into acetyl-CoA and CO2. That's really all we're doing. Don't lose track of that as we talk about the details. Um, uh, but this is going to just be generating acetyl-CoA. This is the first step of uh, cellular respiration. Um, and it's carried about out by pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which is composed of um, multiple copies of E1, E2, and E3. They each have names. Um, these are uh, separate sort of separate enzymes that all assemble into one larger complex, basically. And so basically, the pyruvate enters in. It has a certain reaction in E1. It gets transferred to E2. It gets off acetyl-CoA uh, out of E2, and then E3 is involved with resetting the whole complex back so they can react again. So there's a series of steps that have to happen. As you can see, there's almost more cofactors and, and prosthetic groups involved in this than there are reactants. Um, uh, coenzyme A, CoASH, that's coenzyme A, that's gonna be what um, is added to uh, some of the carbons of pyruvate to make acetyl-CoA, so that CoA that gets transferred here we perform it at the end. Um, we are going to generate NADH from this process. Um, FAD is going to be involved as another, uh, in this case, it kind of acts as a prosthetic group. It's going to be an electron acceptor um, during, during this process. And then there's TPP and lipoate. These are um, prosthetic groups that are also important uh, for carrying out these various steps of uh, this pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. <coughs> So lots of things, um, but don't lose track of the fact we're going from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. It's done by pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, um, and we're, 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 we're resulting in breaking off one of the carbons that's in this basically that, that right here, losing a carbon, and adding the, the other two carbons of, of pyruvate here to, uh, to CoA to form acetyl-CoA. So we lose, we lose some CO2, um, and we make acetyl-CoA, sort of the end result from this step. Okay, so, um, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, also we heard um, abbreviated PDH or PDC sometimes. Um, this is very, very big. Uh, here is a structure of it um, that uh, kind of starts to illustrate what happens, um, how this is this big complex and can process a lot of pyruvate all at the same time in parallel because there's like different pathways uh, throughout all this with lots of different active sites. Um, pyruvate dehydrogenase is E1, so that's the name of what E1 is. There are about 30 copies of that in here, so the, what, the yellow colored part of this structure on the outside of this kind of uh, cylinder thing, um, or I guess a sphere thing, this is like a cutaway from it, so it actually looks kind of like a golf ball if it forms all the way around. E1's all around the outside, so there's a lot of E1s. E2s are quite a few of those. There's about 60 of those in humans. These are dihydrolipoil transacetylates, that's the name of that. E3s, not as many of those. They're kind of at the core. Um, uh, dihydro, uh, dihydrolipoil dehydrogenase. Um, there's about six copies of those. And so the idea here is that yeah, there's multiple copies, 
Um, but they're sort of all combined together here in this multi-enzyme complex. So it allows for multiple pyruvates to all be generating, um, going through multiple pathways here to make a bunch of acetyl-CoA in parallel. So you can process a lot of acetyl-CoA, or a lot of pyruvate here. Also, um, linking multiple enzymes. So E1 is connected to E2, which is connected to E3. And basically, um, it's, it's almost like the, the active site gets sort of adapted. In, like the, 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 the pyruvate and then the acetylcholate that leaves, it's like it gets transported from one active site to another. So it's like channeling between the active sites, kind of. It doesn't actually, it's not like it reacts and then it floats away in the solution and has to come back again, interact again. It's like all built in together. So this is called enzyme channeling and it minimizes side reactions, it speeds up the reaction, um, really optimizes this whole process of these multiple, multiple steps. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, summarizing what this big complex is, is doing here. Okay, so E1, E2, and E3 are what's happening. Now, um, what happens in, in E1, E2, and E3, so different things are happening, like I kind of implied here, the first one is, is, sorry, E1 is where pyruvate comes in. So that's the beginning. Pyruvate is going to be oxidized, um, actually decarboxylated, meaning that the CO2 uh, part of pyruvate is going to leave. So we're going to oxidize the pyruvate and in the process also get rid of the CO2. So CO2 is going to be produced in E1 and pyruvate is going to lose the carbon. So the remaining the remaining electron, or the remaining carbons of pyruvate are going to be linked covalently to uh, some immediate that's present in E1. That will get transferred to E2, and in E2, coenzyme A will come in and will be added to the two carbons that were uh, originated with pyruvate um, and will generate acetyl-CoA. So our actual product here is going to be generated in E2. So we form CO, so technically, I guess the product is uh, CO2, that's one of the products too. So CO2 is produced in E1, E2 is where we actually produce acetyl-CoA. E3, um, this is going to be just involved with re-generating back into the right oxidation state so that the whole complex can start back again in E1, basically. Um, so um, starting to do some of this stuff a little bit more with some of these prosthetic groups that are important for how this works. So TPP, uh, thymine pyrophosphate. I mentioned this in the alcohol dehydrogenase, uh, or I guess uh, the yeast ethanol fermentation step, or what happens if I they under anaerobic conditions in, um, uh, uh, sort of to, to generate uh, in, in yeast. And TPP was one of the prosthetic groups that I mentioned was important for basically transferring and getting rid of CO2. So this is why you, uh, when you have yeast um, fermenting, it produces CO2. It basically, TPP will grab, uh, sort of transfer that CO2 and release it off of the molecule. Um, so thymine pyrophosphate, uh, uh, not, um, so it, 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 it's, it's not the thymine base here that we talked about in DNA. And, um, uh, in DNA. It's derived from vitamin B1. So vitamin B1 is derived into this thymine pyrophosphate form, and it's linked pretty solidly, so that's why we call it a prosthetic group, into the E1, um, uh, E1 enzyme. Now, what it's going to do is um, uh, sort of generally be involved in uh, accepting in, uh, the, the CO2, so temporarily taking the CO2 from whatever the reactant is, in this case, it's gonna be pyruvate, it's gonna bind to the thymine pyrophosphate and then release it. And basically, because it has this sort of um, configuration down here with the positive nitrogen, it can form this litter ion, which stabilizes this and allows for this to happen. So it, the enzyme couldn't do this decarboxylation without this. <clears throat> okay. Now, um, just to show very briefly, and um, I don't want to, I know it looks like there's a lot of, there's a lot of detail on here, um, so I'm not going to. I, I think I want to skip over a lot of this detail and just to say that what the it, 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 what, I just, what I want you to know the takeaway for the TPP is that it's present in E1 that it will take the uh, 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 covalently bind to the um, pyruvate and when it does that it allows for the removal of CO2 um, 
And, and so then what you're left with is a covalent link between the two carbons that are left over from pyruvate to TPP. So that is all happening in E1. So that's the level of detail I'm expecting from the conversation stuff. Not the electron arrow stuff and all the details on the mechanisms, but the fact that pyruvate loses CO2 because it's bound to TPP, and that it's still bound to TPP as an intermediate after the first reaction in E1. Okay? Okay, so um, that's the end of uh, class. So uh, we'll continue with this on Monday.